You are listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net. Dear God, thank you for this wonderful day and many beautiful jorts. Dear God, thank you for all that you've done for us and that we get to spend time with you. Um, that my sister gets better and my mom doesn't have to chase my baby brother everywhere. Dear God, please be be with our church for the foundry and to be with us and guide us in all that we do. Dear God, please help my family to stay safe. Has God ever answered one of your prayers? Um, one day, the week, the day before school, for me it went really bad, so I prayed to God that the next day it'd be better, and it was. I was nervous for, about for a test that that I would um, that I hoped that it would go well, so I prayed to God, and it all went well. Well, one time I couldn't find my swimsuit, so I prayed, and then it's there on my lap. Have a snow day. So, what kind of things do you thank God for? That Jesus died on the cross to save our sins. My family. For everything that God gave me. Um, for giving us food. Roof over my head. Life. Pizza. Please help the grown-ups to um, know that it's okay to just pray. And you don't have to do anything special while you're praying. Amen. Well, welcome, Foundry Church. As we get going today, we're going to be talking about prayer. And prayer in in its many different facets, um, there's many ways that we pray. I know for us as a family, we've prayed with our kids when they were little. One of our kids had a specific prayer um, dealing with all their fears when they were a child. Uh, They would lay down and you'd you'd pray with them and they would pray uh, specifically, it was, Dear God, Lion, Bear, Giraffe, Wall. I'm scared. Um, What was the other one? Oh, yeah, and the scaredy purple chicken, which was the count from Sesame Street. Yeah, they didn't like him, like, whoa, that is a scary purple chicken. So they didn't like the count, and they would pray about these things. One of my favorite things was the wall. Like, it was, they prayed that they wouldn't be, like, eat. They're in the house. We weren't, like, in the woods. Lion, bear, giraffe, wall. Giraffe, which, how gentle is a giraffe? Um, You know, and lion, bear, giraffe, wall, scared. I'm scared of them like that. And they were very little, but it was it was just a moment for them to really kind of pour out their heart and um, tell God what was either troubling them or weighing heavily on them. As we talk about prayer today, one of the things we have to do is get out of our own way, get out of our, our own kind of head and understanding, because especially as a pastor, a lot of people think like, I pray um, better prayers. I super don't. That's not true. Actually, Scripture would say it differently. Luke 18, 17 would have the words of Jesus saying this, Truly I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter into it. And the reality for us is we have to get out of this thing that God is impressed with our diction, our, um, our personal kind of vocabulary and thesaurus that we talk with. And, you know, God doesn't respond to thou better than you. Right? It just, God doesn't speak in the old King James Version. Uh, God speaks to us and understands us. He is the author of, of all communication, all interaction. And when we look at this and understand prayer from that angle, we can just get out of our own way and begin to live a life that is more connected to God in prayer. And today, wherever you're at, wherever you're engaging this content at, I hope that you're able to just dive in and really grab onto this and approach him like a child, even if you're at a grown-up job. Right or in your you're in your high school or wherever you're at watching this, the disciples of Jesus Christ, the twelve disciples, modeled childlike trust by simply asking Jesus a question. They asked him a question at one point, and um, they said, "Teach us how to pray." Would you teach us how to pray? And it's okay if you're not sure how. If the disciples, after following Jesus for a year to two years, really didn't understand how to pray, it's okay for us to say, maybe I don't know how to pray. 
Maybe, maybe I don't have the right words today. And the disciples lean in and ask this question. And today, we're going to learn from what Jesus taught them. We're going to learn from the Lord's Prayer. It starts like this. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray like John's disciples taught them to pray. So they're asking, what type of prayer should we be praying? How should we be praying? And the Lord Jesus Christ teaches them to start their prayer with praise, to start their prayer out praising and recognizing God. When we put God first in our prayer conversations, when we remind ourselves and praise God for who he is, he instantly rises above our circumstances and he is Lord over this earth. And he's not subservient in our minds any longer to the circumstances we face. And so Jesus said, when you pray, say this, our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. What does hallowed mean? That is not something we say often here, right? Nobody really hallows anything. But it actually just means this. It means holy or great. It means set apart and special and purposeful. Remember back in the Old Testament, one of the laws of God was not to misuse the name of the Lord your God. His name is special. Hallow his name. Treat it as holy. Treat it as great. When we praise God, we're saying back to him who he is. Not because God has an identity crisis and doesn't know, but it's important for us to recognize him as he is over this world and the circumstances we face. We're saying back who he is. Many of the things we can praise him for are written in his word, and today we're gonna praise him, and we're gonna use a song. Now, you're sitting at work and you're, or at school, and you're like, whoa, I can't just burst out in song, right? You can't just do that. But what I would like to do is, if you can, throw in your earbuds and pull up the song by Bethel Worship, Goodness of God. When we talk about the goodness of God, it puts us into perspective in um, our own minds related to God. God's goodness, God's faithfulness and his loving goodness in our lives reminds us that he is for us. I would love to have you just pull up that song, The Goodness of God. You can go to YouTube, type in Bethel Worship, Goodness of God, and then come back. Just hit pause right now and then come back and we'll talk again more about prayer. So welcome back. I hope you had a good time um, listening to and experiencing the goodness of God and understanding his goodness reigns over all things. But there's also this aspect to the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray after he says, our Father who are in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He goes on to say, your kingdom come, your will be done, right? Your kingdom come. And when we look at that, we, we realize that in some way Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God has been separated from this earth by sin. Our choices removed us from participating in the kingdom of God. But Jesus Christ is revealing that the kingdom of God has come through him and we are able to invite it in. It's declaring God's authority It is also asking for his will to be done here on earth exactly as it is being done in heaven. It is inviting God to come and bring to bear the kingdom on this earth and to close the gap between humanity and the God who loves them and created them. Your kingdom come. When we praise God and then recognize his lordship in our life, we expect we express in an active living way a trust that he has it all under control. Like, does anybody else ever wonder if he has it under control? Like, I, I feel like sometimes when my life gets chaotic, I'm like, oh God, you know, where are you? We say things like that. And um I don't know that it's blasphemous, but it is wrong because he's right there. We're the ones wandering around. We're the ones who are lost. But when we, when we praise God and express his lordship, what we do is we, we are declaring a trust that he has it under control. That's why we can submit ourselves to his will, to his kingdom coming. 
because God won't force you to par- participate with him. He invites you. You don't have to do it, but it is to your benefit to invite his kingdom to come and his will to be done right here as it is in heaven and to bring the kingdom of God near. But then he goes on to say, give us this day our daily bread. In our modern context, we really don't feel this as much on a broad spectrum, especially where we live. You know, there there seems to be supermarkets. There doesn't seem to be. There are supermarkets full of food, and we can kind of go get what we want when we need it. But when we talk about give us this day our daily bread, it's declaring that we trust him in a way that says you will provide what we need, specifically what we need every day, and we can ask you for help. It's saying, I'm not going to store up for myself the security of this world. I am going to trust that day in and day out, the Lord will provide what I need, enough for today, even if it isn't as much as I wanted. Or maybe it's so much more that I can share. But give us this day our daily bread as a confession of trust that God is our provider and he is sovereign over all that comes into our life. And we can ask him for help. We can go to him and invite him into our crises. We recognize that he alone supplies all our needs. He alone is the one who provides for us. We don't need fancy words. I love the basic um, kind of verbiage of this. We don't have to use a special voice. God, can you provide food today as I need? It's just an ask, will you provide today what I need for today and let tomorrow take care of itself? But it's a day in and day out dependence on God. And we don't have to be really fancy and be like, oh Lord, you know, and like all these great words that sound so important when all we're doing is asking, God, today I need your grace, your provision to be the husband, the wife, the mom, the dad, the friend, the coworker, the son, the daughter, whatever you are. I need the grace today to be what I'm called to be, and I need you to provide it in physical means, in emotional, in spiritual needs. God, will you provide it? I know this, that this time of year, it's that kind of seasonal depression kind of year, time of year where we suffer with the long nights, right? Like back in December when the sun goes down at like 4.30 and it comes up at 8.30 the next morning, you're like, that is a long time for it to be dark and it gets a little heavy. These are things where we can say, God, can you give me my hope for today? Can you supply me with what I need today? Because I'm hurting. I'm feeling down. I feel like crawling into a little den and hibernating through winter. Can you give me what I need today and pour out your hopes, your needs, and your fears to God? He can hear them, and it doesn't have to be in a special voice where you say it. Actually, another one of the ways we can do this is in song. And I would like to invite you to do to respond in really two ways. First of all, I would love to have you take a piece of paper wherever you're at, at your office, at school, on your iPad, on your computer, whatever you're doing, and write down on paper maybe some of the things you need. In, in Scripture, it's called supplication. We, we, we put before God our needs. I would love to have you just take a minute and put before God those things that you need, things that are heavy on your heart, and write those things down. And as you do that, I would love for you to, right before, right before you start writing, click pause and type in on YouTube once again the song, Lord, I Need You. I think it's by Tomlin. And let that song play and go through your heart and your mind. And let the confession of that song, that declaration that God is everything we need, kind of be in your heart and mind as you write out your prayers. Oh, it's Matt Marr. It's Matt Marr, not Chris Tomlin. Correction. So yeah, go ahead and take a minute, uh, click pause on this, get that piece of paper out, and start writing that prayer while listening to that song, and we'll be back.
Well, welcome back. I hope you had a moment to, to reflect and to lay before God the burdens you bear in this life and the things that are weighing you down, your hopes, your fears, and your needs, and that you find God meeting you in your daily bread and giving you what you need for this moment, for this day. But one of the things we have to do is understand that the very next sentence in the, in the Lord's Prayer, the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray, was this. And forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who has sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation. A real quick footnote. To forgive someone who has sinned against you doesn't mean you have to allow them to hurt you again. That's not what it means. It means that you get to set yourself free from hating them or or holding them, you know, in, in some sort of court in your mind, right? In some place where you judge them. Uh, forgiving someone is setting you free from what they've done and, and forgiving them and walking away. But it doesn't mean you have to let them back in your life to hurt you again. But Jesus says, forgive us our sins as we forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into temptation. Did you notice in the song, Lord, I need you, there's this little refrain that says, when temptation comes my way. We have to realize all of us are tempted, right? All of us are tempted. We have different temptations. I don't know what yours are. I do know what some, I definitely know what some of mine are. And when when I find myself um, leaning into, like, I can feel a lot of mine are mood-based. So if I'm feeling down about something or if, if I'm beginning to feel edgy, I am, I am easily tempted to just be to indulge in a willfully kind of just grumpy, rude attitude and treat people poorly. Anybody want to say amen? No? Um, oh, boo! Um, yeah, now I'm grumpy. Um, but I, that, that is one of the ways where I feel like, you know, the temptation for me is to not spiral down and just stew on things and just kind of chew on them. And, and when we look at temptation, we understand temptation. It is not a sin to be tempted. It is a sin when we give in to the temptation. And that's the thing. We have to choose obedience to God over the temptation that seems so immediately gratifying. And you may think, like, how does being, like, in a spiral gratify you? It's because I'm in control then. Whatever's taking control from my hands has um, made me angry or frustrated, but when I can have my mood or how I feel, then I'm in control. It's a temptation to control things. And so as we look at this, we understand that temptation is going to come our way. But sin is when we yield to it and we choose temptation, the temptation over obedience to God. So we have to ask God, invite him to help us when we're tempted. He will always give us a way out. But undoubtedly, you like me have lived a life where there is sin that has marred and messed up your life. And you've got sin in your life. So we confess our sins. When we say forgive us our sins, it's recognizing they're there and there's there's only one answer for them. We confess our sins and we understand that we must repent. Remember a few weeks ago we talked about repentance. It's kind of that dig step in the ground and then we turn and go the other way. Repentance is not allowing ourselves the luxury of continuing in sin though grace abounds right? We stop what we're doing and we head away from sin. Repentance is heading the other way. And when we look at, when we look at our own sin, we can't indulge it any longer. Temptation will come, but sin is optional. We choose it if we want to. We can also choose obedience to God. And obedience to God will always kind of put our foot in the ground and call us in a different direction than we're being tempted. One of the things... Um, we went and saw a band, uh, Erica and I, and uh, two friends went and saw the band for King and Country this past year for their Christmas concert. And I mean, they were, I was really impressed uh, with them. But they have this song uh, called Burn the Ships. And uh, it was a really, it was a really great, like, it just has this power to it. But there's a backstory to the song that, that I think is worth maybe talking about for a few minutes. Because what does it mean to burn the ships? It just seems like wanton vandalism if you read the title. But it's so much more than that. 
It says this, the, one of the band members named Luke said, years ago I read a book about a Spanish explorer who arrived in a foreign land with all his ships and men. However, the men did not want to explore this new territory. They wanted to stay within the confines of their ship because it was familiar and they were afraid to take a risk and step into the unknown. After calling his men to shore, the explorer gave the order, burn the ships so that they could never retreat. They could only move forward. Joel, the other brother in this, Joel and I really resonated with the story of surrendering the past, stepping into a new day, and so it inspired this song and the album title. A newsletter um, uh, later on about this had this to say about the song. The song was conceived in a moment when my wife Courtney, this, this Luke is saying, was battling fear, shame, and addiction. While pregnant with our son Phoenix, she was taking an anti-nausea drug, became addicted to it. When we were, went on this pilgrimage of figuring out how to overcome this, she went to outpatient therapy, but for the next year was still taking Benadryl and Tylenol PM. I came home one day and found her crying, and she said, I'm flushing the pills. I want to be fully present in my life. I don't want to be numb anymore. I'm not going back. It's a new day. From that moment on, she no longer was been bound to the shame, the fear, and the guilt of her past. Her story, paired with the one I read of burning the ships in the Spanish Explorer, when he said, burn the ships, is what inspired the message behind this album. To step into that new day. It's an invitation to leave the past behind. To take that dig step and go the other way from sin and move away. Stepping into a new day. A day that God has ordained for you to begin your transformation into his image. So today what we're going to do is we're going to spend a minute in confession. Wherever you're at, I would like you to take out a piece of paper. Uh, your Again, your computer, whatever. And just... Put it in black and white, right? Write it down and spend some time confession, confessing. As you do this, as you go about the work of confession, once you've written it down, I would like you to have that paper in front of you. Type in on YouTube, once again, for King and Country, Burn the Ships. And spend some time hearing those words as you contemplate what you confessed and what it means to burn the past and step into a new day. Take some time. Do that. Have you ever thought about Thanksgiving and prayer and praying for others? Like Thanksgiving, how we stop and give thanks and how we pray for others. We're not always good at that in our culture. We're so bad at it, actually, that we put a holiday about buying more stuff right after Black Friday comes right on the heels of Thanksgiving, and now we're letting Black Friday even creep into our Thanksgiving. We don't know how to just pause and give thanks to God for meeting us and for that daily bread, that thing we needed that arrived just at the right time in our life. We don't spend time in Thanksgiving as we should. We don't often pray for others and have our eyes outward as we should, but Jesus invites us to just pray out. And I don't know about you, but there have been times where I just pray out. There's maybe something going on in my life, something I'm working on, something that's been heavy on my heart, maybe one of my kids or somebody in the church or something going on and you just pray out, right? We, we just all of a sudden start talking. You find yourself driving the car, talking out loud as though someone's next to you. You're just praying out. Today, I want to invite you into a relationship that allows that kind of prayer life. And I want to invite you to, to look at this um, text that Jesus gives us in, this, in the Lord's Prayer, just following it, and understand that what Jesus is saying to them is um, the heart of how we should be praying, how we should be coming to God continually over and over. He doesn't get annoyed with the sound of our voice. He loves it when we come to him with things big and small that weigh on our hearts and things that have blessed our hearts and we wanna say thank you. He doesn't grow weary of the sound of your voice. Jesus said this to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. A friend of mine on a journey has come to me and I have no food to offer him. And suppose the one inside answers, don't bother me. The door is already locked and my children and I are in bed. I can't get up and give you anything. I tell you, 
even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. And shameless audacity is coming again and again and again, not giving up. So I say to you, ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you for everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. And the one who knocks, and to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you who are fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, give him a scorpion. If you then... Though you are evil, so Jesus is saying, even if you, you hum, human beings, who deep down, we're, we're just evil, we're, we're sinful people. If you who are evil know how to good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? When we understand and look at the heart of God in this, we have to come back to the original idea coming to God as children, shaking off the grown-up lives we lead and coming to God as Jesus described him, a word that was never used in the Old Testament to describe God, but one that Jesus gave us, Abba, Abba, we run to dad, we run home. And I understand for many people, dad maybe not was not a safe place, but when it comes to the kingdom of God, our heavenly father is our safe place. And we can run and we can jump into his arms and we can give to him the things that pain us, trouble us, overwhelm us, bless us, give it all back to him and give gratitude and thanks for the life he has given us, for the air he's put in our lungs, the skills, the gifts, and the talents he's given us to excel in this life. We can go back to Abba and we can pray without all the perfect words. And I just want to dwell on this. I don't know about you, but um, I, as a little boy, had to go to speech therapy. And uh, my mom holds very close to her heart how I used to say my name back as a little boy. Because it's kind of ironic that now I make my living speaking, right? That I, I teach as a living. But I spent a lot of my young years learning how to speak. And those prayers... Those prayers from a a little boy with a speech impediment, I think they had probably a more humble and genuine heart than even the prayers of my adult pastoral life. Not that one's better than the other, but one genuinely was a little boy running towards his heavenly father. And I worked very hard at times just to shake off the, the guise of what it is to be a pastor and just be Eric who needs his dad. And I invite you to do the same thing. Actually, We're going to do it as children would. I don't know if you've ever been near a playground on a school day when recess is out and it sounds like um, just screaming and yelling and talking and there's debates over who got tagged out in kickball and who scored the touchdown and who gets the swing next and why is Tommy clogging the slide again and there's all these things going on and it sounds like noise. There's a way to pray that I would like to invite us to. It's called the chorus of prayer. And you're going to hear it over this recording in just a minute. It starts with the sound of children just praying out. And then you'll hear some adult voices. And I would invite you to join us in prayer. To just join us as as we pray to join us in the chorus of heaven. In lifting up whatever prayers you have on your heart. Thanking God. Maybe praying for those in your family who are in need. Or maybe just are heavy on your heart. Friends, family, relations, whoever, just pray over them and join the chorus of prayer as we run back to Abba, to our Heavenly Father, to our Dad, the one who loves us, and we respond like little kids on a playground. We just join that chorus, the noise of people who know who their source is and return home. Would you join me? And it may sound strange, even as I pray, It'll probably just kind of fade out, and I'll know the kids' voices will come in. Join me and pray along as you feel led. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for this day, and thank you for the way you've worked in our lives. Bless those whose eyes see and ears hear this teaching. May it be not um, a religious model of prayer, but may it be a prayer, a life of prayer, a structure for prayer that they can learn 
to give you praise, to confess, to repent, to offer to you the things they need to see your kingdom come and will be done in their lives as it is in heaven and to participate with you in conversation and relationship, Lord Jesus. Prayer is not something we do to fulfill a duty. It's something we are in relationship with you. Hear us now, God, as we join the chorus of heaven in prayer. There's a lot of prayer all the time. Like think of all the people in the world praying Do you think when God hears it all, what do you think it sounds like? Music. I think he's happy that everybody trusts him. It sounds good because he he knows that people trust him and that um, they believe in him. God, we thank you for Thank you, Lord, for the way that you guarded your church and worked with him. I want them in the Super Bowl. I want the Patriots to win. God, we thank you for today. That might have been a little bit strange for you, but I hope that you learned what it was like to be part of a greater voice being lifted up to God. And you're able to pray to God, not just in the, in the kind of structure, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Saying that is fine, but I would like to remind you, let it be a more full prayer. Let it be the structure of your prayers. Praise God, confess, lift others before God, talk to your heavenly Father, Abba, run to him with everything. Tell him about your day. He's eager to listen and be a part of your life. I invite you to a life of prayer on a daily basis now. If you would like, here at the Foundry Church, whichever campus you're at, West or here at Maine, there is prayer walls on the back and you can now do something. You can take a rolled up piece of paper and put it into the prayer wall. And when you put a prayer in, you can also just grab any piece of paper you want and someone else's prayer request will be on it and you can take some time and pray over that. So we are gonna do kind of a prayer exchange. You may not know who you're praying for, they may not put their name on it, but you can pray for them and the thing they put on the paper and you know that someone else will take yours and be praying for you. Someone you may not even know will be lifting up what is near and dear to your heart. Grace and peace to you as you begin this journey of praying and being in a relationship with your Heavenly Father. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Foundry Church Podcast. If you'd like to know more about us, visit www.foundrychurch.net.